Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. We're a month away from South Carolina's Democratic presidential primary, and that means candidates are flowing through the state, especially in the lead up to Super Tuesday, which is three days after our primary. Leading up to this, I had a conversation with former South Bend Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg at Miss B's Southern Soul Food Restaurant in Columbia. And I led off with a question that's familiar to Mayor Pete, which is how is he getting his message out to the critical black voters in South Carolina? Well, first, take no one for granted and don't make any assumptions that any, anyone will be for you or against you until you've engaged them. Secondly, recognizing that uh, the black vote is not a monolith. Uh, there are a lot of different concerns that different black folks across the state and across the country uh, have. But one thing that uh, uh, we know is that uh, the backbone of the Democratic Party, especially in the South, uh, has uh, long been. Uh, the black vote and in particular uh, African-American women uh, who have led politically and in communities in so many way, uh, ways that we need to be reaching out to. And the truth is uh, there's got to be a listening process here. It's got to be two ways and we're recognizing that in making sure that we've had smaller conversations here in South Carolina uh, where we're doing a lot of listening as well as speaking, uh, making sure we engage the really key issues from economic empowerment to reforming our systems, to making it easier to vote. And of course, we're also engaging elected leaders. That's why I'm uh, so proud to uh, roll out the endorsement to, of Mayor Roberts of Anderson uh, today, uh, the first black mayor of his community, and an example of somebody who understands the kind of leadership that's at stake on the ground as a mayor that we need to bring more of in the White House. So whether we're talking about elected leaders, community leaders, or just getting out there and, and listening to voters, we're going to be using every day that we have to get that engagement done and earn that support. And are you, are you doing too little too late though? I mean you've been focusing a lot on Iowa obviously we're seeing results for you yeah. there but I'm wondering you know when, when we look at what's gonna happen in Iowa how that might affect South Carolina um, do you feel like you have enough of that foundation with the community with the state to help you know, uh, capitalize on anything that comes out of Iowa? I think we do. There's certainly not a moment to lose, especially when you're competing with candidates, some of whom have had years or even decades in Washington, uh, to establish who they are. Uh, but I also am talking to a lot of voters in South Carolina who are deeply pragmatic, and one of the things they want to see is proof that you can do well. Of course, the first chance to do that is in Iowa. So I, I recognize that uh, a lot of savvy South Carolina voters are going to be looking at what happens in those first contests as they're deciding uh, on that question that's so important important, I think, to, to Democratic voters, who can win, mm -hmm. who can be elected, and who can defeat Donald Trump and take us to the future. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about Charlemagne the God the other day, and I uh, wanted to get your thoughts. He was pretty direct with some of his questioning, but it was yep. interesting because it was, you know, that's the way it should be sometimes. And he, one of his questions was, you know, how do we know you're for real? How do we that's know right. you're not just like selling us a bill of goods, essentially? Because we always hear these white politicians come around to the black community and say, oh, you know, X, right. Y, and Z, they never show back up. Well, what, how do you tell, how do you say, what do you say to them to say, I will be back, I will make sure that your priorities are number one? Yeah, I think Charlemagne's speaking to a sense among black voters that they have been taken for granted, that politicians come along, say all the right things before election day, mm -hmm. and then we don't see the results. And so part of what I'm inviting uh, him and others to do is look at our story in South Bend, uh, not because it's been perfect, but because we've demonstrated before, during, and after elections what it takes to get things done. I shared the story of uh, uh, one of our most respected uh, ministers in the city who, who said when I was showing up at the church as a candidate back in 2011, hey, everybody knows how to come to my church before an election. Let's see what you do next. And now we have been able to partner uh, with him and his congregation on things like developing affordable housing in the area around the church. Uh, we're inviting elected leaders and, uh, for example, Councilwoman Sharon McBride, uh, who will be serving as one of my campaign co-chairs, uh, showing why I have the support of most of the black elected leaders from South Bend who know me best, who know what we've done, know what we've been up against, uh, and can share our city's story. I think it'll be just as important to talk about that track record of results as it will be to talk about the plans we have for the future. Uh, you know, the plan I've put forward, we call it the Frederick Douglass Plan for tearing down systemic racism in the country with the powers of the presidency. Uh, it, it's a great plan that's been very well received, but I get that voters want to know what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. and whether you mean business before they're really going to be impressed by anything that's in your plans. Are they, are they discovering that in South Carolina that you did a recent tour here? I think so. That's certainly the virtue of the smaller events that we're doing. It's one thing to do an event with a thousand people and, and uh, uh, kind of a classic campaign rally. It's another to have uh, 30 people uh, in a room talking about health equity as we did in Charleston. Uh, to have a, a small group discussion about African American business development uh, as we did uh, in, uh, in the area of Roundo. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to have the, the more intimate conversations that really allow us to uh, make sure people understand not just what I'm proposing to do, but mm -hmm. who I am. 
Yeah, because you even admitted to Sean, like, you were worried about having such, you know, monolithically white crowds at some of these big mm -hmm. events. So I'm guessing you're trying to change that strategy, get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with these communities of color where they where they meet, essentially. That's right. It's not enough to just announce an event and see who comes to you. you got to come to people, find them where they are, uh, engage the issues that are of importance to them, and, and show versus tell your commitment to earning that respect, that trust, and ultimately that vote. What does Iowa look like for you? I mean, it's, it's still such a big field. And then what does a win in Iowa look like? Obviously, if you come in first, that's a win. But, you know, second or third, is, is that going to be good enough for you in your opinion going forward? How do you how do you read Iowa at this point? I think it's going to be fluid for the next uh, days all the way up until caucus day. I, I'm meeting some caucus goers who say that they're going to decide the day of, maybe when they walk in. And that's why we got to uh, keep building it on the enthusiasm of our organizers who are going to have a presence on the ground. Uh, the, the truth is that uh, uh, right now uh, uh, any of the top candidates uh, is in a competitive position. But here's why I would not want to trade places with any of my competitors. We've got a winning message that's powered us past most of the others. Uh, we got a phenomenal ground game that is engaging voters where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think we're speaking not only to how to win, but how to govern. Remember, this is about who's going to be the president after Donald Trump. I can explain why I believe I'm the right candidate to beat him, why we should have somebody from the middle of the country, from the middle class, somebody who served in uniform and can call the president out on his deceptions. But it's not just about beating him. It's about what we've got to do next when our nation is going to be divided, mm -hmm. it's going to be exhausted from politics, and still in need of dealing with issues from education, crying out for more support, to the crisis of gun violence, to the problems we see in our climate. Uh, that message, I think, is going to carry us all the way through, and a good finish in Iowa is my first opportunity to show versus tell uh, that we know how to get elected. We'll be seeing you push hard in South Carolina, too, but I want to get one more question, Absolutely. really. Um, these billionaires in the race, I want to get your thoughts on having so, many, so much money in the race, personal money, obviously not dark money, but you know when we see yeah. Tom Steyer putting money, Mike Bloomberg pouring money in, how do you, how do you make, the, how do you feel that affects our democracy and the whole process? Do you think that's fair? I mean, we've seen people drop out because they yeah. don't have that kind of money right. to throw around. What do you think about that? So, according to Forbes magazine, I am officially the least wealthy person running for president, mm -hmm. and maybe that's a good thing. It's certainly a disadvantage in that I don't have billions that I can dip into to pay for my own commercials. But it also yeah. means that I don't have to have a focus group to understand what's going on in the middle class. I can just go to Target. Uh, a year ago, I was driving my Chevy to, to work like everybody else. And these conversations, I think, are drifting away from reality sometimes in, in the, the commentary on TV. Uh, I do think that there are a lot of problems in the way our elections are run. But I'll also say this. The importance of these early states like South Carolina and the others is that no matter how much money you throw on TV, people get to see you actually looking voters in the eye. Mm -hmm. responding to tough questions, demonstrating who you are, not just what you say. And there's no substitute for that. It's why I have such respect for this part of the process that you can't buy. You have to show up and earn it. You talked about election security last night. Do you have any fears about, you know, either unsafe, unsecure elections or what election interference might be looking like going forward, maybe in the primary and also in the general this year? There are a lot of concerns, and it's not just around the polling places. The biggest concerns right now, I think, have to do with misinformation and disinformation being spread uh, by foreign actors who want to interfere with our elections. And we shouldn't be naive about the forms of election interference that are happening in broad daylight. Uh, when we talk about some of these uh, uh, requirements that are being put on uh, the ability to vote, uh, restrictions on polling places, mm -hmm. purges of voters from their rolls, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's election interference, and we've got to stand up to it. It's one of the reasons why I am calling for a 21st Century Voting Rights Act to speak to these forms of interference that are disproportionately hitting black and brown communities and are, in many cases, I believe, changing the results of elections and not in a good way. Um, Looking at maybe if you were to become president, Pete Buttigieg, uh, and there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court, what would you be looking for in a Supreme Court justice qualities? Uh, what kind of candidate would you want to see? Well, I'm looking for somebody who shares my understanding of freedom to include uh, reproductive freedom for women. Someone who shares my understanding of democracy to include the bedrock importance of voting rights. And somebody who can think for themselves. And there are so many great figures uh, in, uh, uh, in America right now who deserve uh, opportunities to serve, whether it's on the Supreme Court bench or on the federal bench in general. But we've got to make it a more diverse body too. Not just racially diverse, uh, but also professionally diverse. Right now we have way more people with a prosecutor background than those who have served as public defenders, for example, making their way onto the bench. We need to, need to make, make sure that there is balance on the bench and also consider reforms to the courts themselves to make sure it's less political 
less partisan and not just one more battleground in our politics. Courts need to stand above and apart from the partisan political process that we see so much of in a place like Congress. Mm -hmm. And you're a millennial. I have one quick last question. Um, my producer wants to know what your AOL screen name was back when we all had Instant Messenger. Do you oh, remember what your screen name was? Wow, I'd be hard pressed to, it definitely existed. Uh, I'd be hard pressed <laughs> to, to dredge that up. But uh, Very good. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about how away messages might have been the original tweet. Yep. Uh, because you'd say go. a little short, pithy thing and think that you're clever and yeah. leave it sitting there for everybody Simpler to see. Simpler times, though, right? Simpler times. Mayor Pete, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. As Congress continues to deal with the impeachment of President Donald Trump, South Carolina's congressional delegation is looking at ways to improve the state. We recently caught up with Tom Rice, the congressman from the 7th Congressional District, in studio at ETV. Joining me on This Week in South Carolina <coughs> is Congressman Tom Rice from the 7th Congressional District of South Carolina. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Gavin. So we're in 2020. We saw a big 2019, especially a big <coughs> budget. You're on the House Ways and Means Committee. I want to start off by talking to you about what we saw go through that big budget, uh, specifically what benefited South Carolina and your district, obviously, and uh, the PD and the Grand Strand. What, was, what were some of the big highlights of that budget for us in South Carolina? Well, I didn't vote for that budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, almost 3,000 pages and dropped on us uh, literally within less than 24 hours when we were supposed to vote on it. it was chock full of uh, items of pork and things that we're st I'm still discovering uh, uh, here we sit a month later. So, uh, uh, and it also dramatically increased spending in across the board. And so it just wasn't something I could support. It did have some things that I had been pushing for in it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, things like uh, a disaster tax package for folks that were affected by the most recent hurricane. Well, actually, it was Hurricane Florence. It's been that long since uh, and it, the, the bill was long overdue. And it had a, a, a bill that I'd been pushing for for years where uh, the IRS has had discretion, if there's a disaster, on whether or not people in the affected area would be allowed an extension on their tax return. And so happened several years back a storm hit on September 14th. There's a lot of tax returns due on September 14th. Mm -hmm. Employers and people were calling me and saying, what are we supposed to do? Take a canoe back to our house and file our tax returns? Do we get extension or not? So we now that's permanent and it's mandatory. Anytime there's a federally declared disaster area, people get an automatic 60-day extension. There were other provisions that I wanted in there as well uh, that didn't make it into the permanent uh, uh, provisions but were allowed for the 2017 and 2018 storms. Mm -hmm. So basically the, the budget bill just being <coughs> so big, I know some of your other colleagues in the Republican Congressional uh, Caucus here in South Carolina also didn't vote for it because of those reasons too. Right. Is it just that there were some items in there that you knew would benefit South Carolina but overall just not enough time to see all yeah, the good, I didn't, all the I didn't know what was in there. In fact, I, 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 and I don't think anybody knew everything that was in there except for the staff on the Appropriations Committee that stuffed all those things in there at midnight before uh, right before we voted on it. Uh, I actually had a reporter come and ask me about some tax provisions that were in there that, that I had not heard about. And I asked the Ways and Means staff to give me a list of the tax provisions that were in the in the budget bill, and that's a terrible way to legislate anything, and I could not support that. Mm -hmm. And just kind of looking forward <coughs> since that, um, you know, what do you see this year in the budget? What are you pushing for, and, and again, possible priorities for South Carolina, for your district, uh, at least in the budget, or other legislative priorities? Well, my number one priority for my district is, uh, in terms of hurricane recovery, we still need to get uh, money allocated to people who were affected by the most recent storms. Uh, we've gotten about, oh, just under $100 million in housing recovery money allocated so far for Hurricane Florence, but that's not nearly enough. There were 11,000 houses that they said had what they call, quote unquote, moderate damage, and the definition of that is water in your house less than three feet deep. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that the amount of recovery is not nearly enough. And then I-73 is a huge priority for my district as well. Uh, it crosses three of the poorest counties in South Carolina, Marion, Dillon, Marlboro, and, uh, and then into Ori. It would affect tourism, it would affect agriculture, and it would attract industry in areas that have been left behind for a century. <laughs> yeah, so. and I-73 has kind of always been in a little bit of a purgatory. I mean, have we seen any traction on that possibly moving yeah, forward? Yeah, I mean, we've had, we've made a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we got the permit, finally. You know, when I got to Congress, uh, it was it was just kind of dead in the water. Nobody was pushing it, and I pushed for three years, got the permit. And then, uh, uh, actually, Horry County 
put up local money, uh, twenty million dollars a year for twenty years as match money. The governor applied for a, a, a grant from the federal government for three hundred and sixty million dollars, and then Horry County and the city of Myrtle Beach started fighting over. Uh, how that $20 million was to be spent. So it kind of uh, put the grant on the back burner, but I think they're getting close to resolution of that dispute. I hope they are. There's nothing that we can do that's more important for my district than that build that road. Mm -hmm. I always say infrastructure is opportunity. And the study that was done uh, before the road was built said it would create 29,000 jobs and that it would uh, produce an annual return of 25% in tax revenue mm -hmm. for the state of South Carolina. So. You know, if you, any investment I can make where I get 25% return, uh, sign me up. <laughs> and I don't know if that study is true, but if it's half true, a 12% return is still amazing, uh, particularly in these times. It's long overdue. You know, the Grand Strand is is over 30% of the total tour, tourism revenue. Oh, gosh, if you include Orion Georgetown County, it's 50% of the tourism revenue for the state of South Carolina. And uh, uh, it's the only top 10 tourist destination in the country that's not served by an interstate. Uh, and also, you know, if Horry County, Marion County, Dillon County, Marlboro County suffer from a fairly low wage base, low, low earnings. And if you're going to diversify your industrial base and get more permanent, high paying jobs, you have to have infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The Dillon Inland Port was a huge step in the right direction. Um, and that, that shows you what infrastructure can do. You know, the Dillon Inland Port connects the, as a lay down yard for the Charleston Port. If, if trucks coming out of New, uh, North Carolina and Tennessee and Virginia and everywhere else coming down 95, they can stop there, drop their load, not have to drive through South Carolina and tear up the roads and roads more than there. create <laughs> traffic and, and all that. And so uh, uh, if they get it there by five o'clock, they can have it on a ship the next day. And that, that little piece of infrastructure has created 1,500 jobs in Marion, Dillon, and Marlboro counties. The unemployment rate in Marion County in January of 2017, when uh, Donald Trump took office, was 9.6%. <laughs> and today, it is 4.5%. It's less than half of what it was two and a half, three years yeah, ago. Yeah, South Carolina beating the national average on unemployment, <coughs> too. So we're got more jobs than we have people it seems like so between the uh, between the tax reform bill uh, and regulatory reform and revised trade agreements and other things we've done to make our country competitive uh, and certainly the president's had a lot to do with it but on ways and means I helped write that tax bill mm -hmm. I helped with regulatory reform and I've helped with trade so I, I want to claim a little bit of credit for it between that juicing the national economy and things that the state of South Carolina has done like the Dillon Inland Port uh, has really affected people's lives. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the 1%. <laughs> I'm talking about people who desperately need it, you know. And, and it was something you just brought up uh, about, about more jobs than, than we have people. That's true. If you look at Darlington, Florence, and Chesterfield, and other areas with industry, and, and Ori and Georgetown as well, there's more there's employers screaming for employees. Yeah. But yet, <laughs> and this is the next part of the equation, in Marion, Dillon, Marlboro, we have 30% of the people live in poverty and outside the workforce, generational poverty. So, you know, their parents weren't in the workforce and their grandparents weren't in the workforce. So the next step in, in terms of we've got the economy moving very well, we're putting infrastructure in place, I-73 is the next step, but the next step after that is how do we engage these folks that have never been engaged before? And we're we're working on that too mm -hmm. through the technical colleges apprenticeship programs, things like that to help get people in that that work pipeline. It sounds like well, you know, Gavin, I, people aren't aware of this, but you know, uh, you go to the University of South Carolina tuition is twenty five thousand dollars a year for in state. To uh, uh, Clemson, it's a little bit higher than that, and you know, folks go there, and I, I think we do a big disservice telling everybody they have to have a four year degree. Mm -hmm. You know, they go and they get a degree in whatever major and a lot of them come out and struggle to find a job that has something to do with their major, right? Uh, where these technical education programs, if you come from a poor family in South Carolina, it's not cheap and it's not a loan, it's free. Folks, it's free. <laughs> and the, the, the president of Florence Darlington Tech tells me he could place a thousand diesel mechanics tomorrow, mm. making $50,000 a year and they can't get people to sign up. 
computerized digital machining. Uh, they can take 80 kids a year. It's a two-year program. They got two problems. They can only get 40, ki 40 kids a year to sign up, and then half of those don't finish. You know why they don't finish? Because there's such a need for them that they get hired away before they can finish the program. And these kids are making fifteen, sixty thousand dollars a year. And just to kind of wrap up <coughs> the economy and, and workforce, but we were talking about the budget earlier, and you were talking about spending kind of, you know, rising and rising, deficits going up. Uh, at what point are we going to start seeing more calls for, you know, reining in spending and 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 kind of controlling this this deficit? The only trend? way that we're going to do that is we've got to we've got to work on entitlements. We've got to fix entitlements because entitlements is over two thirds of the federal budget, and. Uh, I, and I expect we'll do that in the first, in the second term of Donald Trump's presidency, mm -hmm. because no president is going to do it in their first term. Because if they do it in the first term, they're not going to get a second term. So I expect that uh, as soon as uh, President Trump is reelected, that we will uh, entitlements will be number one on the list. I mean, every expert tells you that Social Security, anybody who knows anything about it, Social Security, will not be able to meet its obligations in 2034. Medicare, same way, probably a little earlier. So, so everybody recognizes that these issues have to be faced. Healthcare, the, the cost is out of control. So uh, everybody, but they're hard decisions that have to be made. And again, wh whatever decision you make, you, you're going to you're going to aggravate one section of the population or another. And speaking about President Trump in the second term and looking at impeachment, we were talking up in D.C. in December. Uh, right after the vote on both articles, you voted against both of them, as all Republicans did. I um, wanted to ask you about the Senate trial that's going underway right now and just kind of what it's like in Washington and how you see this, this Senate trial playing out from what you can, we can see in Washington right now. Um, it's a circus. You know, the whole deal with uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, sitting in the statuary hall and, and signing a, a signing ceremony for the for the articles of impeachment and handing out souvenir pins and solemnly walking down the hall. Uh, I expect that uh, this thing will, uh, you know, that it'll be adequately heard in the Senate and disposed of in, a, in short order. Mm -hmm. And with the government, <coughs> the government Accountability Office, the federal watchdog came out with a report the other day saying that the president did uh, violate the Impoundment Control Act by holding up the $400 million to Ukraine. I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think about that report coming out saying that the president did kind of essentially maybe abuse his power of office, which was one of the articles of impeachment. Does that sway you in any way, or what do you, what's your reaction to that report coming out? I think abuse of office is such a subjective term uh, that, and I think it's, you know, Alexander Hamilton and the framers of the Constitution warned us against using impeachment for political purposes. And I think that if, if that's your grounds for impeachment, uh, that you think the the president abused his office for this or that, then it, it bodes ill for the future if every time there's a disagreement that we're going to be impeach, uh, bringing impeachment articles. No, I don't, I don't think it's sufficient. Uh, I never have thought it was sufficient. I really do believe that they, uh, this started before the president was even in office and uh, that the intelligence community was involved in it. They clearly were. And then when the president... Uh, uh, removed James Comey for a very good reason. They use that as saying it's an obstruction mm -hmm. <laughs> charge. And, uh, I've always said that the president did make a mistake when he removed James Comey. He should have. The mistake was he shouldn't have waited till May to do it. He should have done it the first day he got to office because he clearly James Comey had abused his office more over and over again well before then, and all that's come to light now. Uh, but no, I, I I don't think that. I think Nancy Pelosi was exactly right about one thing, and she said it in a very cogent, clear way. She said last May that impeachment is very divisive for the country, and so I will not bring impeachment forward unless it is both compelling and bipartisan. Mm -hmm. And in the end, because she was forced by her base, she brought forth impeachment that was neither compelling <laughs> nor bipartisan. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was bipartisan the other way. There was a bipartisan vote not to impeach goes. And just last question, wrapping up, you said uh, you expect the president to be reelected this year. What, what do you, how do you see uh, this impeachment trial and the votes from the House? How do you see that playing out in the 2020 political landscape when it comes to elections in the fall? I think people in the country are mad. You know, I think they see we're making progress. You know, three and a half percent national unemployment, sub four percent unemployment in South Carolina. Billboards with teachers, you get a $2,500 signing bonus. 
the unemployment rate in Marion County, one of the, the, the poorest county in the state of South Carolina, cut in half in two years. No, I think I think people see real progress, and that the the that the Democrats are throwing a temper tantrum here and uh, and trying to undo the election. I think they're mad. And if you look at the polling numbers, it bears it out. I mean, the president's polling numbers are higher than they've been pretty much since right after he was elected, and they continue to rise. So I think people want this over with, and they want to continue to see progress. I, I still believe what Bill Clinton said about the uh, elections that it's the economy, stupid. And we've got a pretty good economy now, and I think people will vote their pocketbooks, and I think Donald Trump will be reelected. Re I could be wrong. Who knows what will happen. We're 10 months away from the election, but uh, I'm feeling pretty good about things right now. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like we're going to, Donald Trump will be reelected, and we'll get, the, we'll get the House back as well, but we'll see. Congressman Tom Rice, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. For more coverage from the campaign trail in South Carolina and the State House, check out scetv.org backslash TWISC. You can also check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a weekly political podcast I produce each week with reporters who cover the State House and politics in South Carolina. From the South Carolina State House, I'm Gavin Jackson.